Okay, hello everybody and welcome um, to this panel as part of the 2024 Festival of Politics in partnership with Healing Arts Scotland. Um, my name is Sarah Kamal and I am Engagement Creative Director at Scottish Ballet. Um, so we've had a slight change to the programme, who, the person who is originally chairing. So I'm coming in from Scottish Ballet, so my connection is definitely more from the art side. Um, but I'm delighted to welcome you all here today. Just a little um, intro, I guess the values we have at Scottish Ballet are around inclusion, excellence and innovation. And um, our desire to strive to create a positive and welcoming environment and uphold a space of mutual respect. So I'm really delighted to share that space with you today as we go into this discussion. So this panel is all about place and displacement and reconnecting with the world through the arts. And I am delighted to welcome our panelists, Sangeeta Isravan, Dave Caesar, and Christopher Bailey. We're going to start off with some panel introductions um, and then I will pose some questions to our panel to discuss and then we're going to open it out to everybody to ask questions and um, if you have some at the end. Just to let you know the event is being filmed and will be available to watch in the future on the Scottish Parliament YouTube and the Festival of Politics website. Okay so let's kick off with some introductions. Um, Christopher can we start with you please to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your work. Can, but when you introduced yourself, uh, I mean, before you were Sarah, I don't recognize faces. But Sarah Kamal, you're, you're a choreographer, no? Yes, yes. Yeah, so you, choreo you, you chore choreographed a, uh, a, a piece for us at WHO in Geneva. I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a WHO. So I didn't even realize that <laughs> until two seconds ago. So yeah. thank you. Um, in back in April, and that was our first connection actually before this um, Healing Arts Scotland event. So it's lovely. Yeah, to be back. no, it's yeah. a privilege to be with you. So uh, <laughs> anyway, my name is Christopher Bailey. I'm the Arts and Health Lead at the World Health Organization. Um, I, I guess that's enough for now. <laughs> Dave. <laughs> Film. So it's uh, my name's Dave Caesar. I'm a doctor uh, locally. I'm an A&E doctor. Um, so I've uh, been working in emergency medicine for uh, about 26 years, on and off, um, and sort of substantially for maybe the last 20 years. Um, and um, have sort of uh, grown to understand what uh, the arts can do, uh, where medicine, what medicine can't do, and what the arts can do. Um, so I've been sort of building my knowledge uh, and experience around that, uh, whilst also um, understanding what it can do for us as healthcare practitioners as well, um, and understand what, what the implications are there. So uh, I've had uh, reasonable attempts to try and uh, incorporate a lot of that uh, learning into everyday work uh, in Scotland, and we can talk more about that as we go on. Thank you, Hello. Anakam. Uh, I'm Sangeeta Ishwaran and I'm from Chennai, India. And I run an NGO. I founded an NGO called Wind Dancers Trust. And we have worked in more than 30 countries. And a lot of the work, of course, it is with marginalized people. And a significant section is with displaced populations. Um, Manipur, for example, right now has a, a genocide happening, so we work with them. We work with refugees in uh, France and uh, in Cambodia, landmine victims, internally displaced people, Myanmar, Indonesia. So we are really, I am really committed towards looking at not making maybe uh, displaced people into artists, but what arts can do for social transformation. How can you engage with populations and how can you hold the space using the arts for healing, but also to make decisions for the future, to gain more agency? Thank you. It was much longer than Christopher. I can go longer. <laughs> Why don't you go a little bit longer? Tell us a little bit more about your work. Oh, it's very okay. interesting. So. Well, uh, let's see. I was born in Duluth, Minnesota. No, no. <laughs> uh, I am... Um, the work actually, uh, back in the day when I was young and beautiful, I was a professional actor based in New York City. I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Uh, I also was a literature, I studied romantic literature at Oxford. Uh, 
and um, then got involved with philanthropy. I was the research manager at the Rockefeller Foundation for many years. Um, uh, and at uh, the World Health Organization, I was originally brought in to um, head up a knowledge management strategy. And uh, what, what I found was that um, when, um, when I was working in rural HIV clinics and villages in Africa, if I would just come in with uh, a solution, um, people would be very polite, smile, nod their head yes, and wait for me to leave. Uh, that the, the best way to actually engage the community was actually using theater techniques. And I used a theater technique um, from Augusta, Augusta Boal from uh, Brazil, uh, the th theater of the oppressed, uh, a forum theater, where you come in with an incomplete script and you use the community to complete it. Uh, and, but you don't tell them it's a theater uh, technique because they wouldn't do it, you know? Uh, and then evenings and weekends, I was running a theater company um, in Geneva, uh, and I would do the opposite, where I would fold in health and development themes into what we were doing, but I wouldn't tell anyone because they wouldn't watch it. Uh, but they were very popular. So when Dr. Tedros became the director general of the World Health Organization, he put out this famous call to staff for crazy ideas, and I thought, well, this is my time to come out of the arts and health closet and, uh, and, and declare uh, that these two things can, can go together. Uh, so that's what we did. And the, the three baskets that we work in is the basic science. Uh, what what I, I have created through the Jamil Arts and Health Lab a network of research centers that look at um, what is happening neurologically and biochemically where we can say the deep aesthetic experience has uh, some sort of salutary effect. Uh, but also, um, uh, in these interventions, uh, how, how effective are they? Uh, can we put them through some rigorous study to see uh, what works, what's scalable, and, and what has the most promise to reach the most underserved populations? Uh, and then the other areas are actual interventions, because I've always felt you have to have your hands dirty, you can't just talk at the normative level. And then the third was working with um, uh, media companies, uh, like uh, collaborated with Netflix on some projects, and uh, the most famous one we did was the Together at Home concert uh, at the beginning of the pandemic with Lady Gaga, uh, which I have stories about. But that's, that's longer. Um, and I'm really interested in some of the things around uh, your research base and evidence that you've been touching on there, and I've, um, we'll maybe come back to that a little bit later. It's less sexy, but it's the most important part. <laughs> um, first of all, you know, you've um, touched on working with displaced populations, and we, we started having a conversation just before we came in, actually, of kind of what that might mean and the kind of different contexts or different... Um, different ways that that might happen and I just wonder if you can talk a little bit about your specific experience of working with displaced populations and what that what that looks like in an artistic context in a medical context and what is displacement and what is displacement yeah um Sangeeta do you want to sure. start us off uh yes um actually we had this conversation this afternoon so I'm going to sum it up differently when I work with displaced populations, eh, I come in um, to as an external facilitator. Mm. Uh, and sometimes I come in right at the beginning when you're receiving people, right? And you have to get them settled down and you have to get them food and shelter and the basic needs are met. Sometimes I come in later when they're already settled down and they're looking at a way forward. It really depends on the project. But usually I come in with a very specific goal. For example, I would work with Emmaüs Solidarité in Paris, and that would be working with women and children around sex abuse, around domestic violence, their rights in France, because the camp would have a health center, but they wouldn't go. The women didn't feel like that was something place they could access. So the so Médecins Sans Frontières was heading that particular uh, center, and they asked me to come in to bridge the gap 
they wondered why people weren't going to the center unless it was a deeply uh, affected issue. Uh, so I was also training staff along with the doing workshops with the population, with a lot of children, with adolescents, with women, on the lines of gender empowerment, sexual violence, and the nurses and the doctors would be part of the workshops and they would be building those connections with the people. And that meant more and more people would reach out for this medical help. Mm. So what the artist was doing there was bridging a gap, right? And so I come in to bridge gaps. It could be uh, you have the Rohingya population from Myanmar who's now going to be stuck in India for a good long time because they can't go back. And then how do you integrate that population? How do they find agency? How do they find jobs? So I would go in with a group that would be thinking about skill building, but they would have finance and microfinance, but they wouldn't have the skills to get the people together and talk together and build groups, divide tasks. That would be my job. Or it would be after a tsunami or an earthquake. And my job could be going from babysitting children because their parents have to go to other stuff mm -hmm. to helping healing with meditative processes, yoga, movement, because I'm a dancer and I work through the body. So I've done a huge range of projects um, across different countries with displaced people. It has always had an element of agency mm -hmm. where you want the population, you want the group to decide what the next step is. And some of it is really weird. I've worked with Afghan youth in France because the local perception of Afghan youth is, um, you know, young men are the most difficultly perceived, sorry, my English is my second language. Uh, it, they're perceived the most difficulty because you look at young men who are coming from these countries who will rape your population, who will, you know, they will disseminate discord. Whereas women and children generally have a little more empathy towards their plight. And we had this hilarious workshop on how do you approach women? Because they are young boys, they are adolescents, and they have feelings and uh, you know they want to manifest those feelings, but they don't know how because the cultures are so different. And so it's, it really was a f super fun workshop and had a very different goal than say sex abuse or right to work and right to speech. Yes. So that is the range of my work. Thank you. I'm interested, um, and maybe we'll come back to this in a minute, about hearing more about specifically how you use dance to, to bridge this gap and do some of these things. But we're going to come back to that. And Dave, can I hand over to you to yeah, talk about your so, work? Um, so the, dis the displacement of individuals, again, there are some, some very sort of obvious examples of that uh, often in uh, areas of crisis or with sort of seismic activity or, um, or natural disasters. And um, as, as we were discussing a bit before we came on, uh, actually quite a lot of displacement happens uh, in the home, in communities, hidden from view in a way that uh, might not seem evident. Uh, and a lot of that uh, is manifesting through um, my you know, so my clinical practice, so people come to emergency rooms, emergency departments, um, because of uh, a social crisis or a feeling of displacement um, uh, that manifests either through a physical issue or through a mental health crisis or through an inability to uh, have their needs met in some shape or form. Um, and... Um, that can, uh, the origins of that can stem from uh, trauma and or um, uh, developmental issues uh, or societal issues, but they, they are there, um, they are there in plain sight um, all of the time. And my, my sort of, the start of my sort of, I suppose, um, uh, both kind of disappointment that the medicine that I've learned <laughs> didn't fix that, uh, and also that sort of path to enlightenment was uh, that you know people were coming, we were, they were coming in with uh, either um, physical health issues or um, episodes of what we would term in the trade deliberate self harm, whether that's um, drug overdose, sort of 
recreational drug misadventure, for want of a better word, but, but a lot of sort of self-medication against a sense of displacement, essentially, or uh, a sense of hopelessness, or um, a sense of loss uh, is very sort of prevalent mm. um, and misunderstood uh, and it's sort of labelled as kind of bad lifestyle or that's just, you know, uh, they're just kind of um, they're letting their life go uh, and not really understanding the underpinnings of that. So there's a bit of people just coming back and back and back and back um, through through to my department and thinking, this, what is what is happening here? What are, we, what are we not doing that's preventing this cycle? Um, and um, learning that what I, what was in my sort of toolbox was not right. I mean, it was helpful in the immediate in terms of making sure they didn't die, uh, but beyond that, not actually helping them move on or um, progress or heal, as we've been talking about over the last couple of days. And then as I learned more, learning more about what arts could do in that space, so then seeing some of uh, that in action in also, they wouldn't probably necessarily be described as displaced people, but people who um, might have a commonality of disease process. So Parkinson's is a great example, MS is another, dementia is another. These people are displaced from their existing reality or their expectation of life as it was before. And seeing how um, dance, movement, music can change uh, not only their outcomes, so what does that mean? Well, you know, their, their reliance on modern medicine, but also actually can liberate them from that identity that they find themselves mm. with, uh, which, which, which was incredibly powerful to me as a sort of, I suppose, a medical practitioner, sort of going, well, my God, this is, you know, this transcends what medicine can do, mm. essentially, what modern medicine could do, I should say. And, um, and then through COVID, actually, COVID was the ultimate displacement uh, for, for many people. Uh, and we're still working our way through that. So mm. there are whole tiers of society that still are displaced post-COVID um, who need, uh, who, who again are coming uh, to healthcare to deal with loneliness or social isolation. Uh, and so we, do not, we do not have the answer for that mm. at all. And clearly, because that's, you know, our healthcare systems are overwhelmed with, uh, with that sense of need without a meaningful solution to it. Mm. Um, and that, that we, we, so that, for me, is, the, is again why I'm sort of so committed to be in this space, which is because the solutions have to lie somewhere else, not necessarily in other sectors or in other services, but they, they have to lie in a different approach mm. or a different understanding of how you meet those needs through different uh, elements of what communities can do, what individuals can do, perhaps sometimes what services or sectors can do, but ultimately it's not, medicine will not cure that. Mm. Um, and that, that honesty uh, in the healthcare sector it, it isn't necessarily as apparent as it should be, which is that there is a limit. There is a limit to what we can do. Um, and we need to understand where those limits are um, if we're going to really address people's needs. Um, mm. And some great examples of where understanding that, so a bit like you were saying, Sangeeta, around access to healthcare. So in, in COVID, um, quite a lot of what we would term marginalised communities wouldn't, wouldn't take up the vaccine, for example, mm. or the vaccines that were on offer. So how, how do you connect with them in a way that makes them... Uh, have confidence mm. that this is something that they should buy into, you know, and again, it wasn't, it w we needed to think differently about that mm. um, and have a different way of telling that story, which again is like, it's based in the art, storytelling, connection, engagement. Um, so lots of, <coughs> lots of, lots of examples of, of where that's come, come into a displaced community. Yeah, thank you. And then thinking about meeting some of these needs that you've, that you've been talking about, you know, you've touched on some of the, um, like social isolation and loneliness and how um, the arts can make connections. And I think building from that, um, Chris, to bring you in here, I'm interested in the, the specificity of arts engagement and what is it about the arts specifically that might help people um, and help to meet these needs within health? 
Well, uh, I think in the case of displaced populations, um, there are many levels of trauma. Uh, the trauma could be uh, a conflict where there is actual physical violence, the destruction of the home. It could be a natural disaster where it's the same thing, really, except instead of it being humans, it's a storm or whatever, or economic uh, displacement. Uh, and whenever you have um, a traumatic event that you've experienced, uh, there is always a form of uh, dissociation where uh, you, you literally feel like your spirit has been evicted from your body, uh, that your body is no longer a safe place. And in a way, more than metaphorically, if you've been moved out of a place, it's, it's a similar type of eviction. It's, it's more than just a physical relocation. It's uh, y you feel like your spirit has been left behind. Uh, it's, it's that powerful. Um, and <clears throat> in terms of um, what WHO does, uh, or, or the, the, well, no, the question was, uh, what, what can the arts do? Um, I'm going to bear with me, touch on a little bit of neurology, uh, if you don't mind. Um, there, there is something called um, uh, proprioception, which uh, Oliver Sacks talked about in his book, A Leg to Stand On. Uh, he was hiking in the Alps, <clears throat> and he fell, and he had a grievous leg injury. And it took him a long time to recover and go through physical re rehabilitation. But after the leg had physically healed, he still had this awful, dreadful sensation that the leg was not part of his body. And what he realized is that his sense of proprioception, which is the way the brain maps to your body, to other people, to the world around you, even your sense of time, um, uh, is a function of the brain that when interrupted, it's, it's incredibly disorienting. Uh, and what the arts can do is provide that reconnection neurologically. Uh, so, for instance, when, when I was uh, recovering from a, a cancer operation, I literally had the sensation of floating above the ceiling down at my body because my body was no longer a safe place to be. Um, what brought me back? Um, an image of a tree outside of the hospital room, a sign of life, uh, an image on the wall uh, that I could focus on uh, and, and begin to triangulate uh, back. Um, my my um, caregiver, my surgeon coming in and him placing his his hand on my shoulder and explaining to me what happened. And in my morphine-induced condition, I ha it was just all blah, blah, blah. I had no idea what he was saying, but I could feel the warmth of his palm on my flesh. And there was that connection. And um, so in the deep aesthetic experience, uh, when you have a line of music, uh, you, you have the, the composer creates a state of anticipation, of wondering what's going to happen next, and that creates a dopamine reaction. Um, when that musical line becomes resolved in a way that you were not necessarily expecting, but makes complete musical sense to what has gone on before, uh, it's almost like a mini catharsis. There's that moment of shock and awe, and you're rewarded for that moment with a little shot of uh, oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone. Uh, it's, it's what we experience when, when we have sex. It, it uh, uh, reinforces our sense of connection. So literally, it helps us reconnect uh, to our bodies, to each other, to the physical world around us. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why um, uh, music, uh, uh, intense beauty, um, landscape can have such a powerful effect. Um, with uh, a, a lot of displaced people, part of it is also just reconnecting to that sense of joy and beauty somehow. And uh, when you're in the presence of something like a, a mountain range uh, or the seaside or 
uh, a, a beautiful piece of music, something that is not only beautiful, but is much larger than yourself, you feel, um, you, you don't feel diminished. You feel like you are a small but important part of a larger whole. And that sense of awe actually helps repair your broken sense of proprioception. It, it has a healing effect. Uh, so, so there are direct ways that the deep aesthetic experience can help us neurologically repair, but it's more than just a repair job. It's, it's, it's actually finding that personal authentic meaning that uh, allows you to move forward. Uh, Carl Jung had two quotes that I always go back to. The first quote is, loneliness is not the absence of people. Loneliness is the inability to express what matters to you most. If you can find that expression, you can reconnect. The second is, meaning is what allows us to endure. Uh, and, and that's part of what Aristotle was trying to describe in the catharsis, is, is uh, that moment in the story where suddenly the truth is revealed but hidden from view were all the steps that were leading up to that moment that you weren't aware of. And you create that meaning from the chaos of, of events that you felt were out of control. Uh, what Nietzsche called um, uh, amor fate, falling in love with your fate. His idea of human happiness is if you could achieve that moment where you look back on your life and all the choices that you made, things that you were in control of, things that you were not in control of, and it inevitably led to this moment, and this moment is good, you've achieved human happiness. And that's a creative act. Uh, so, so there are very powerful elements yeah. there that can help you replace yourself, you, yeah. help you uh, associate instead of dissociate. Thanks very much. And I think um, then bringing that to Sangeeta, to your work, to, to relate. So you work um, with people through dance of a means of empowerment and conflict resolution. And there was a moment there where, because you were talking about the uh, power of, of touch um, as well, which is maybe something that happens in a, in a dance setting. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your approach and what practically different sessions might, might look like or what somebody might experience and how that helps them. Okay, um, so I am trained as a Bharatanatyam dancer. That's an art form from Southern India, which goes back, we have history going back more than 2000 years, but concretely we can at least trace it to a few hundred years uh, in the form that it's practiced now, though there are other ways in which we trace it. And I locate my work in this practice because it's informed the way I move and I find it beautiful to see how patriarchy is located in my body. Right? And I will not sit like this or be as chill about, you know, the, my body language is informed by the fact that I am identifying as a woman in India and that's all anchored in my body. So I start from the body. I start from, if I stand this way, I am sending certain signals. If I stand this way, I'm sending other signals. If I look like this, I'm sending some signals. If I look like this, I'm sending other signals. We are constantly sending signals to our body. The format practice is total theater. It's not just dance as perceived in the West. It's dance, it's music, it's vocalization, rhythmic vocalization, and it's theater we speak. And I use all these tools. But I use them on three different levels. I'm going to start with the most subtle level. So as an artist, sometimes I'm not using my art form evidently, like obviously. Um, let's say I'm working in COVID time. There's 8 million migrants wanting to get back home. And the police doesn't speak the language. They speak Tamil. And there's hundreds of mostly young men, but families too, that are speaking only Hindi or Bengali, right? And I speak a little bit. And I have this vivid image that there were just four of us artists standing between a crowd of 500 people and 100 policemen. And we know that we are the four that can stop a riot from happening. How does it matter that we are artists? It matters because I can make eye contact. I can smile and say, even if I'm speaking broken Hindi, I can say, don't worry, there are solutions. 
because I know the minute they charge, it's going to be full on conflict, right? And it's already happened. It's happened the night before and the night before that. And then you come up with a solution that you stand there. <coughs> and then you say there's the power of being a woman. Men are actually less likely to see me as a threat than say another man in that position. But my artistry and my art form gives me the ability to communicate without words to reassure people with touch, with eye contact, with smiling, with holding the space, and then making them into lines, and the police sees it's okay. Sometimes, I was just telling Chris this morning, there were two groups, uh, one on top of the stairs in a small room, locked up there, another group trying to get up, and both screaming their heads off, and I'm in the middle of the staircase with no mask, nobody's mask, it's the beginning of COVID. And what I did was I went, ow! I just howled like a wolf and everybody just stopped and stared at me. They were like, who is this mad woman, you know? And, but it stopped a conflict and artistry gives me that power and voice to do the stupidest things, to make people laugh in the stupidest situations to get beyond their fear, right? So that's one level. Another level is where I use my dance in very practical ways where I'm using movement, I'm using body to empower, I'm using eyes, I'm like saying, making these exercises where you make eye contact, because even before you do this, shake, shake, yeah, I can shake my hand, I won't bite you. Uh, <laughs> even before you shake your hand or you do this, you make eye contact, that's what people do. And in dance, in my form, we use our eyes in many ways. So I build so many, I call this eye semiotics, so many ways in which you can use your eyes to be inviting and be show that you are at peace, but you can also use it as a stop, you know? And sometimes just that look stops men from attacking. We train women all the time in self-defense, but not just because they're doing karate, but just because you can stand and say, bus, that's enough, step away. And that, that confidence, that contact, that power of the gaze is real. So there I'm using my art form actively to empower or to give people techniques to communicate, to find solutions in spaces of conflict, Hindu-Muslim conflict, right? Or it, with sex workers who are trying to fight for their rights, whatever the area. So you're working with empowerment, with finding solutions, but from a space of what we call empathy-based social transformation, which works on physical, emotional, intellectual, and sensory. He describes sensory so beautifully. We completely negate the senses. Sometimes in our workshops, I have just an orange and I'm rubbing it on people when they come in. And then at certain points, when I want to make a point, I'm like, smell your wrist, and they're smelling the orange. And that anchors the discussion. And I met a participant 10 years later who tells me, even now when I'm feeling distressed, I pick up an orange. And I go back to that space where we had so much fun and there was such positivity and love in that room. So there's so many techniques you can use viscerally to build a space, so that's the second. The third is the most obvious, which is creating performance, very high quality performance with non-dancers and non-performers, but for advocacy. So in climate change, it's been used so much. We use it for gender-based violence. Now we are going to create a performance with 1,000 people, with men, women, children in villages across Tamil Nadu for alcoholism and substance abuse, because there's no point arresting after the fact when someone has beaten his wife to death or harmed his children, why are they drinking, right? So how can you bring people together to talk about the problem and let the shame go, let the fear go, accept there is an issue and that I will not be shamed for it, right? That is so important. So these are the three levels in which we work and now of course, we just did a workshop with police officers, and they, I mean, the first thing I remember is they all had big mustaches. This whole thing, a man with a mustache is very important in India to prove masculinity. But I got in these masks and these fake mustaches, and I got a whole bunch of women to put on mustache, and their body language has changed. Just because they had this fake mustache, they were like, Whoa, you know? So there's so many strategies you can use, and people were laughing their heads off, and I had these big mustachios, police officers, talking about marital rape. Marital rape is not even a thing in India, but imagine this, I'm leaving you with that. 90% of marriages in India are arranged. Very few are love marriages. Love marriages is actually a thing. You can say, did you get married, you have a love marriage? You actually say that. 
Now, you don't meet your partner, right, before you're married. Now, maybe if your family is very nice, they might allow you to have a couple of conversations on the phone, right? And then you get married, and essentially your first night of, of intimacy is rape. And you're expected to build a life with your partner, with this history. And you can't blame men. You can't blame women. You blame society for shaming an essential act of intimacy, right? So you're looking at generational change. Your body has to feel it and change. Your eyes have to communicate it. You can't talk about it. Just talking does nothing. That's why I truly believe everything is located in our body. Even in our meditative technique, I ask people to think of what makes you happy or someone you love. And you immediately, if you watch your body, you can feel it. You can feel the heat of anger. For me, I feel it here. My throat stops. I can feel love. Right? You locate it in your body because your body is how you communicate with the world, how you interact with the world, your sense doors. So, yeah, so that's Padma mm. <laughs> Thank yeah. you very much. And I'm interested... I think kind of building from this to hear um, Dr. Sia from a medical perspective um, and I guess also you um, are part of the um, Scottish Ballet Research Group and how your experience in arts now has also impacted how you might um, view things from, from that medical perspective. You've touched on or spoken to a little bit already, but if you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I guess, um, so it, they sort of, they um, overlap in a number of sort of different areas. Um, the, the, most, the most obvious way is um, having that, a bit like Chris was saying, that combination of understanding about the sort of biomedical model and that, un that understanding is developing all the time in relation to things that have tradi traditionally been put down as choice. Mm. So, uh, and trauma, especially developmental trauma, is a very obvious uh, place where that, that understanding has really grown over the last five or ten years. And from, from strange places, so quite a lot of the research has actually been done around uh, neurological conditions and some what, what are termed functional neurological uh, conditions um, and um, I think there will be more there will be more that will come through which is oh actually it turns out the origin of this thing that we didn't really understand and that our medicines didn't really work for or that we poo pooed as a professional sort of community uh, actually all stem from this thing that we didn't really uh, know or really understand and so uh, so functional MR scanning and things like that some some of the technologies that, have, that are coming through have actually really exploded people's kind of understanding about the, the origin of that so developmental trauma which in Scotland has a whole language around uh, adverse childhood experience um, and it doesn't really matter what we call it but it is but it is endemic um, and uh, intergenerational uh, as Chris and I were talking about um, earlier, um, has has a profound neurological effect. So the way that um, our neural pathways develop is absolutely determined by uh, some of your genetics, of course, but also the way that um, you experience relationships in the first moments of life and before that. So, um, so in the first five years, the way that you experience safety and love uh, and uh, that sort of uh, bond with uh, your mother and or father, but, um, you know, your parents and or the way that that environment um, is shaped for you has a direct influence on your ability to create neural connections. And then from about five years to about 15 years old, um, those connections are, um, are evolving. So they're growing. There's still quite a lot of plasticity in the brain at that age. But we know that, again, if you experience trauma at that age, it can have a real impact on your ability to uh, 
um, uh, to generate, to self-generate what we would call these days as sort of resilience, but actually there are many other factors that, that then are impacted by deficits in those uh, things that we take as sort of common, the common building blocks of a life but actually are absent in some shape or form, or there are singular events that make that more difficult. So if you have a singular traumatic event as a child, if, if, if the wraparound to that is not well managed, that, that impact will be pronounced throughout mm -hmm. the rest of your life. And then, interestingly, so we, we have a view, not just in healthcare, so, so in, in my hospital down the road, you become an adult at 16, well, that's, that's nice, but actually, neurologically, uh, you fully develop those neural pathways. They then sort of, it's interesting, they go through a sort of, a sort of slight culling uh, sort of episode. So you reach your neurological maturity. Uh, in girls, of course, it's earlier. Um, uh, they do everything quicker than boys. Uh, but um, you reach that neurological maturity if you're a female at about 23, 24, and in males about 25, 26. Mm. So we are, we are terming people adults at 16 when they might physically look, and most of them don't, but physically they might look like an adult, but neurologically you've got 10 years left of development. And that, those 10 years are enabling you to make what is called executive cognitive uh, function. So that's, those are the decisions that you can make that have consequences that are beyond the, the immediate. Mm. So the ability to save money for retirement, to not smoke because your friends aren't, to not drink because your friends are, to eat healthily, to are all, all of the capacity to make those sorts of decisions are being shaped between your 14, 15 to 25, 26. And in that moment, in that moment, you need social connectivity, you need love, you need a person or people you can trust, you need psychological safety, you need the ability to, for, th those are the conditions by which neural networks form the most healthily. And if they're not there, you then get blamed for making bad lifestyle choices often. <laughs> so there are folk that have come through sort of a variety of neurodevelopmental traumas or uh, an environment that actually gives them no chance to develop the cognitive function to make good lifestyle choices that then we are punishing sometimes and so sometimes through the criminal justice system but it's also through healthcare and then not only that when they come into healthcare settings we're re-traumatizing them by dehumanizing them by calling them a number or a disease or basically removing them of their identity and individuality um, because that's how healthcare works, which is sort of inhumane in some, in some shapes and forms. So, so, so actually understanding that you need a, a humane approach alongside a technical approach for doing the thing, so fixing the leg or you know, mm. sewing the wound or treating the infection or whatever it is, but you need to be humane around that or else you will only sort of um, propagate any neural deficit that they might already have mm. and lead to further difficulties with them engaging properly with things that are going to make them less likely to become ill in the future. And, and this, is, this is a real misstep for us as a, a you know, that is modern, modern medicine that has to sort of re-understand that mm. um, to be able to, to bring that back. Um, and also treat people with compassion who may well have no choice other than to be in the situation that they are mm. because, of, because of the house they were born into or the situation that they were born into or the thing that they suffered through no fault of their own. Mm. So as important as executive functions are, I, I'd like to make a case for stupidity. <laughs> um, Sangeeta, you mentioned before uh, that you could actually disrupt a negative cycle through doing something stupid. Yep. Um, there's a profession that does that, and clown? it's called clowning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I am a traditional it, clown. Are you? Yes. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so you know. Uh, and uh, uh, at the, in the first summer of uh, the 
full-scale invasion of the Ukraine. Um, I was in Moldova with a group called uh, uh, Red Noses International. Uh, and they had a program called Emergency Smile. And so I was with this group of clowns working with uh, uh, mothers and children um, who had just taken refuge from uh, the Ukraine. And many of these children um, had dark circles under their eyes. They clearly hadn't slept in weeks. They would wake up screaming, anxious. They hadn't eaten. Uh, they, they were traumatized. And when um, the clowns came in to this group of children and their, their mothers, they came in a little parade, uh, the kind of parade that clowns have perhaps been doing for centuries, with their little out-of-tune toy instruments. And at one point, uh, and, and the children didn't really know what to make of it. They just sort of stared going, what the hell is this? And then at one point, one of the clowns tripped and fell. And there was a silence. And one child laughed, which gave permission for the other children to start to laugh. And pretty soon, this wave came over. And as the clowns started going into their routines, these smiles started to appear. And it, it literally felt like um, uh, rains hitting a desert after a drought and the the desert flowers suddenly began to bloom as smiles you know because these smiles had not existed for 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 months and the mothers then began to cry because they hadn't heard that sound it, it was just such a remarkable thing and as i worked with the clowns i began to see how um, they actually intuitively use the language of dissociation uh, you know, I talked to before about how even in your own body, uh, a part of your body that's been injured suddenly is not part of you. It's dissociated. Well, that's how clowns work. You know, suddenly, you know, they begin to have conversations with their hands or their, their legs go one way and their bodies go another. And, and dissociation is actually part of their vocabulary. Uh, so... And, and one of the first rules of arts therapy is meet people where they are. You know, arts therapists, if you're feeling sad, do not play a happy song. You know, arts therapists uh, play a sad song. And then you take a journey together. And clowns know how to do that in a humorous way. And, and the redemptive power of that laughter is, is so uh, moving to experience. Uh, and... Yeah, I, I, so, so I, I just want to put in a plug. We, we, we talk about trauma so much and healing and recovering and coping and dealing, but sometimes a good laugh <laughs> is, uh, doesn't take away the trauma, doesn't cure anything necessarily, uh, but um, it, it, it does change the frame. Yeah, you know? changes the energy in the room. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it, these conversations tend to get so serious that so sometimes I just like to remind us that there, there are these unsung heroes out there that defend joy, and I, I just like to promote them whenever I can. I like that idea of defending joy. Yeah, and I guess it's that's okay that's to be happy, <laughs> yeah. even in the worst <laughs> circumstances. But what they don't do is they, they don't say to someone that's sad, cheer up. Um, when I was uh, talking to the Minister of Culture in the Ukraine, and he was uh, uh, interested in, in this work, uh, but it was also sort of counterintuitive to him because from his perspective, uh, the role of the arts is to boost morale, to combat misinformation, uh, but not to take a population that has been traumatized by war and do something depressing or do something that, you know, uh, that, that didn't make sense to him. So I started to explain to him uh, what I just mentioned, the meet them where they are, take a journey. And it's it, it still, he, he wasn't sure, you know. And so rather than explain it, I just demonstrated it. I talked about how I sat down next to this Ukrainian boy and I sang this song that I remembered from my childhood that acknowledged his fear but took him on a journey. It was, tell me why you're crying, my son. Are you frightened like everyone? Is it the thunder in the distance you fear? 
Would it help if I stayed very near? I am here. And if you take my hand, my son, all will be well when the day is done. And if you take my hand, my son, all will be well when the day is done. And he got it. Okay, now that makes sense to me. And we're thinking about um, joy and connecting, and I'm seeing some nodding and uh, the hand in the audience. So I'd like to kind of put it out for questions and for interaction. Yes, can I take your question? I think there's a roving mic is coming over so everyone can hear, but also you can probably shout loud and we can hear. Well, thank you very much. My name is Johanna Suleta, and I work between diplomacy, the corporate world, and arts and culture. And very on point with uh, what you were all saying and regarding the clowns, I was born in Colombia and I wanted to add uh, two more examples. Uh, Colombia was perhaps, uh, the, if not the most, among the top five most violent places in the world in the 80s and beginning of the 90s. And there was a, um, a complete disconnection between the citizens uh, Bogota, the capital, was at the peak of that uh, because it was also trapped between the drug cartels and the government and all of it. And, uh, and it was a chaos to manage, let alone people were in this self-defensive mode. You couldn't trust your neighbor, you couldn't trust anybody. There was a lot of aggression collectively and trauma. And uh, we had a mayor um, called Antanas Mokus, he was uh, um, actually a refugee from the war. His mom was an artist and a sculptor from Lithuania, and he became the dean of the university in Bogota. And uh, he he became the mayor without any further uh, any any background in politics. And actually, a parenthesis on the context: he became the mayor because uh, in one revolt at school. Uh, people were booing him and he always thought I would do something if that happens. Mm. Uh, and he did, uh, there's someone who did something called psychomagia, psychomagic, um, with Holodovsky, I don't know, the, the, but all these interconnect. And it's about doing violence without aggression. So he, he, he being the dean of the university, walked and mooned the audience when they were booing and put his trousers down. The educational um, authorities asked for his head at the university and asked him to resign. But he gave such a speech about why that was an act of peace that he won over the entire country and then he was elected as a mayor. Then as a mayor, he always, and, and he's featured in a book by the Harvard professor Doris Sommer about how art can influence society, where she's been one of the pioneers worldwide gathering cases for the last plus 20 years about how art has been healing in, in society process. And, and she features him because then his whole strategy as a major was what would an artist do? Mm -hmm. And when he became a major, the first thing he did was bring the clowns. So <laughs> he said, people are more ridicule of being afraid than paying a fine. And, and so he created these cards. This is in the 90s, like a bank card size that you could fit in your wallet. And it had a thumb. And he wanted to de-escalate violence. So he said, instead of swearing at people, just put thumbs up if they do something good, thumbs down. And this became a whole social game, and people didn't respect zebras for the crossings or the elders or any other car. And now everybody wanted to be seen doing good, and the clowns were mocking everybody. And you were either being ridiculed on the street or being mm. supported. So it was. It, it, I I recommend you all to see this. There's a documentary about it in YouTube. Uh, called Bogota Cambio about Antanas Mocos. But then I have a question and, and one last comment regarding laughter as well that I don't know if you are aware of or we can all use uh, in our circles and environments. But a friend of mine through the COVID period, um, there was this app that became global. Um, it was only on sound. The name escapes me now, but never mind. There, the, 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 it was an in and out pop-up of conversations. And then uh, they 
invited me to a yoga laughter every Monday. Mm. And so yoga laughter means that when you laugh for more than 30 seconds, your brain doesn't know, or even if you just laugh fakely, your brain after a certain period doesn't know if you're laughing fakely or not because it picks up the whole body vibration and so on and it gives you in these ecstasies. So we were laughing for 10 minutes every month <laughs> and, and it was a, almost a religious appointment and I would like to invite you all, perhaps if you would like to laugh, with me for 30 seconds and we can experience it so <laughs> why not let's try it we've been talking about crying so <laughs> and so i i wanted to add that also to you but thank you so much for for all the examples that you've brought thank you very much for those for those examples of those questions and for i think really good picking up on that importance of joy and laughter as you've been talking about it. and I can see some smiles happening across as well. Is there anything else that anybody wants to kind of put out or ask to the panel at the moment? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I know that Chris, you do, your work is pretty global. Um, uh, <laughs> yes, um, I, uh, I to this world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, it, it, this panel has been such a delight because it's the first time that I am encountering your work, uh, uh, Sanjila and David um, and Sarah. So I wondered uh, if you also operate in different continents and what kind of collaborations you have in, 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 in that sphere. Like, of course, it's very important the work we do in our communities, but I also believe this is such a best practice example to the world that also are things that can be replicated by other communities. So I wonder if, if that's already happening or otherwise, you know, yeah. happy to collaborate as well. Thanks. Maybe you can tell us a bit about the different, I mean, you've talked a little bit about contexts that you work in, but um, thank you to earlier, we were talking a little bit about, um, I guess about kind of very, different contexts you might work in, how you might adapt work and how you, I think it's going back to what you were talking about, Chris, as well, of meeting people where where they're at. Um, and if you have any examples of, of how that happens. But the other thing your question is making me think about is um, how your arts practice relates to identity. And Dave, you talked about um, the medical... Um, sphere and people maybe becoming a bit anonymous or becoming a number and how the arts then can help people reconnect into into their identities and what that can do. Thank you, thank you, Ponky. Okay. Uh, sure. Um, so between, you know, when I was young, a long time ago, uh, between 20 and 30, I traveled as much as I could and even after, trying to work with as many communities as possible, but trying to tap into local arts. So I think in the last 20 years, I've 30, 40 countries with many different communities, but always trying not to impose the form that I know, but using some technique, but also trying to generate, um, if you're in the Nishi tribe, then you work with Nishi uh, singing and music and dance. and you use that to question the problems and find solutions, right? Uh, so a lot of the work does revolve around joy and love and empathy, but it's also hugely, I try to work on the principles of non-transaction because when a community knows you're coming in with an agenda, it's very different from when you're coming in with a question or when you're coming saying, what do you want versus I want to do this. It's like you give a drowning man water, it doesn't help. So some things like rhythm, I have used pretty much across many cultures. Uh, body movement, centering, you start with populations that are very disempowered. When you're doing a small clapping exercise and you do this, very often women who've been through massive abuse will go only till here and the eyes would stay down. So there's certain things that can transcend because Bodies are still bodies. When you fear, your breathing changes. When you're angry, your breathing changes. 
when you're happy, your breathing changes, right? So some things I found are universal, like breath practice, rhythm, expression, emotion, and something I root in the local. So I do my research on local mythologies, stories of trees and heroes and heroines and local you know, uh, stuff before I go. And it's, each one is a new experience. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, so, so identity is really interesting in healthcare as it is in lots of big in, sort of institutions, I suppose, in organisations. Uh, and so my, my, I mean, my, my context is Scottish, but UK, I suppose, and I've worked abroad, but the work I do around with the arts or the work I help support in the, in, in the arts is in Scotland mainly. And, um, but as Sangeeta and Chris have clearly demonstrated and said, it's, it, it is a more, much more universal language than, uh, than that. Um, the identity is very interesting. So both from a professional perspective, we, we, were, we were sort of slightly joking earlier that it's, it's, actually, it's often very hard to get professionals, medical professionals or nursing professionals to, um, to really sort of uh, buy into or commit to uh, or to believe in the power of, of art in a healthcare setting. Mm. Um, and they, they play out that, uh, that sort of identity um, very powerfully. Um, and yet they will all go and do the arts thing as soon as they leave hospital <laughs> or they leave their healthcare. So they'll, 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 they'll literally just go and they'll literally just take, take off the uniform and then go and do it. And you're like, like literally, you just told me I can't do this here and you've gone and done it. Um, uh, and that's and, and central to that is the is that we have a we have a healthcare workforce that actually finds com some comfort in not humanising their their own self in that setting. So it is protective for them mm. to be the doctor or to be the nurse because if they turn up as a human and connect with humans in on a on a level. Um, uh, it can be overwhelming, and I think people. I think that's part of what, where we have. It's both a symptom of and sometimes a cause of burnout, mm. um, and it is a protective mechanism. Partly because we are. As so, when I was when I applied to come into medicine or was you know able able to get into medicine, I was not recruited on my ability to connect with humans, at all, at all. That was not the criteria. The criteria was how much information could I hold and then regurgitate in exams, um, and how, how could I do that repeatedly? Um, which has nothing to do with... Which I'm actually, I'm, I'm quite good at. Yeah. But that's, that's, not, that's not what people are looking for when they yeah. come and see me, yeah. surprisingly. Um, so, um, so, so we are surrounded by a healthcare system that um, are... Um, that can sometimes, and it's changed since, I mean, I was, you know, it's in the 90s, but, it, but it's changed slowly and only recently to develop people that actually understand what empathy is, let alone are empaths or have good practice in that space, um, but can, that can hold emotion and can deal with emotion and can uh, manage the emotional burden of working in, Healthcare settings, and yet still have objectivity. So, so yes, and that, and so, actually, if anything, we sort of swung the other way, which is we have now empaths who now, <laughs> who now struggle to deal with the that that burden, but are excellent communicators, um, but are are actually we've got whole generations of of um, healthcare practitioners who um, are, are sort of trying to refine that balance. Uh, which is how much mm. they are holding on behalf of other people. Mm. I, great artists can have that objectivity and be empathic at the same time. Well, so, uh, and great doctors can too. Yeah, but we but we're not creating them. Is the thing we're not we're not doing it intentionally. We're doing it by luck and by uh, whereas great performers will be able to an artist will be able to do that because. 
that is how they're great. But that's not, you know, you don't win a Nobel Prize for being able to, to do that. You, you win a Nobel Prize for doing other stuff. Um, and, uh, and so we va what we value actually is, is, is different and the, mm. sort of the, the sort of feedback mechanisms around what, what good is mm. haven't kept pace with how we've recruited and trained. And this year's and Nobel Prize for bedside manner goes to. <laughs> <laughs> it should be one. Do you know, but, Don't you know, think? Um, <laughs> there certainly could be some bloopers in that space. But so, um, so identity, so that identity is protected, and also on the, if you like, on the other side of that, um, is it's it's protective and also dehumanizing mm. for patients. Mm. And one of the most powerful things in the dance health space, which is the main bit that I'm sort of involved with, um, has been seeing patients become dancers. Mm. So people that viewed themselves, that were told that they were a patient, that they had MS or they had Parkinson's or whatever, um, suddenly exist as a dancer. Mm. And, the, and the transformation that that creates in them. Now there is a, then, then there's a whole thing of when they start moving and uh, responding to live music, that actually their reliance on medication and uh, their ability to unlock themselves, especially in the Parkinson's space, when they're in tricky, when a tricky situation, which is a very common kind of scenario that creates a lot of anxiety for Parkinson's sufferers. So that, that ability to, to both reduce their reliance on medicine, which is again part of the sort of, part of the lock and key that healthcare has on people. Well, you need this, you need this, you need to take it regularly, you need to do that. Well, mm -hmm. yes, maybe, but um, so we, we, arts can liberate people from that as <coughs> experience and also give them an identity that they never thought they would have, mm. ever. Yeah, I suppose that um, idea of how, how people are seen and the language that's used and how um, that can, I guess the arts impacting people's self-concept as well, self-confidence and um, finding different ways into the arts as well. Um, I want to come back to one thing that you said as well, but before we do that, is there any questions? Is that a hand over here? Yeah. Um, yes, my name is Yara uh, Benka and uh, I'm the founder of Red Noise International. Oh, well, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you didn't know, I know. No, I didn't know. You didn't know, I know, and so thanks for the flowers. Um, <laughs> thanks for the flowers, thanks you for have mentioning us um, and the work. Um, so, Yes, we have this program of Emergency Smile where we go to crisis areas of this world, um, uh, human-made, natural-made, uh, political-made. Um, uh, but our base is the daily visits in hospitals, in, with adults, uh, with, with children, especially children, for sure, but uh, also in geriatric uh, wards, um, and more and more. But I want to come to the point um, very often we heard this word healing. Mm. And we know that in our Western society, uh, the word healing has a double connection, double interpretation, you know. There are lots of people who would like, um, who would kind of climb on the trees when they hear about art is healing. No, doctors are healing, you know. Art is maybe a nice uh, thing to have, but it's not necessarily healing because what is missing? The databases, you know. Uh, so, uh, there we, we have this conflict about this word healing for uh, being, uh, being esoteric kind of uh, exploitation of, of, of a serious uh, matter. And um, the more I, I think about it, the more uh, I'm also into this word healing, but we have to, um, to see that we clowns, when we arrive somewhere, uh, we work on the emotional part of our encounters. But then there are the doctors, the nurses, or the people working with in these crisis areas, you know, on a daily basis. They can continue to work on the cognitive part, you know, to digest everything, what they have seen with the clowns, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this collaboration is so important. So I think uh, when we talk about healing, we have to know that it this is a huge cooperation 
and I think this is a wonderful conference here because it doesn't stop to talk about cooperation in this way. And um, so I think um, also our work needs cooperation. I think to, to fulfill his real destiny, it is good to have cooperation uh, wherever mm -hmm. we are, you know. So thanks for the flowers again, and that's my country. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think it's um, interesting to pick up on what you were talking about there about cooperation, and I think it goes into what I was going to ask um, to the panel as well, picking up from Dr. Caesar's point of um, who needs to be convinced? I think that's a question you kind of touched on that, and who needs to be convinced of the um, power, so to speak, of the, the art, so the, the value of it, and how do we... Go about doing that. Um, well, I would say probably lots of people. Um, and it probably starts with, so uh, probably starts with communities and citizens, if you like, um, which have put rightly a lot of faith and a lot of investment in healthcare, for example. Mm -hmm. So they believe that, especially in the UK, in places where there's you know, free at the point of access, that the healthcare service will, will fix them when they are broken. So uh, we'll heal them. But that's not what the healthcare service does. And so they, they need, so there's a bit of, they need to ask a different question. Mm. And we need, to, as a profession, as a system, to encourage them to ask those questions. But we, there's, a, there's absolutely uh, a professional element to this, which is that most of my colleagues would say, of course, we own, we own healing. We do that. I haven't trained for 25 years to not heal people. Um, to not know what to do, to not know what to fix people. So there's a bit of, you know, again, that thing of the more you, the more you invest in something, the less likely you are to give it up. Um, and we spend, um, I don't know what it's up to now, but probably 19 billion pounds a year in this country on healthcare. You know, we're not going to suddenly turn around and go, oh, I don't know if it's doing what we, but, but the evidence would suggest that it's not doing everything that we thought it might. And probably there's, you know, across most Western healthcare systems, there's a large amount of resources that are spent on things that are unfixable. Not only that, that might be, dare I say it, that might be harmful in a way that we might not measure in that sense, but certainly that other things might be, might make people feel better, even if it doesn't make them live longer. So again, we have, to, we have to work out what matters to us mm. as a society, and we have to have a conversation about how we best deliver that and or help people meet those needs. That is a very difficult conversation to have. Mm. It's a conversation I have with people often under duress, if you like. So you've come to me with a thing that I now have to then broach a reality with you that you, want, that you weren't prepared for today. You didn't come out, you didn't get out of bed today to have this conversation with me. So by definition, everyone that comes to me comes to me is having a bad day. Hmm. Um, some of them are having a really bad day. Some of them are having their last day. And I have to have that conversation with them. And they, they were not ready for that that morning. Some were, but most weren't. And the question is, how are you going to have the best last day that we can make and sometimes that's so it's interestingly you talk about clowns coming to hospitals interestingly the one place where no one has any problem with um, bringing something a bit alternative into that sort of setting is uh, dogs all the time like yeah bring the dogs in they can come you can come and lick you know it's like it's like really like we can't have we can't have musicians in hospitals we can't have artists in hospital but the dog the dogs can come anytime <laughs> And the horses, you know, occasionally. It's but it's maybe, yeah, maybe it's the wolf syndrome. I don't yeah. know. But, um, uh, but it's, it's 
phenomenal, you know, the whole the pet thing. But anyway, but yeah. Yeah, each to their own. So, um, but the, um, but there is a there is a conversation that needs to be had about what is it that people need and what is it we're trying to do and how honest can we be about what we can actually really do, rather than just have mm. this unshakable belief that healthcare can do it all because it can't. I have a question for you. I'm reversing it. I know you have questions, but I have a question. Um, one thing we ask people, because uh, in my village, for example, uh, the lady who runs our free kitchen, Parim Lama, uh, Amma is like mother, if she's sick, she wants me to take her to the hospital and she wants to get an injection. She doesn't care what's in the injection. She just says, if you give me an injection, I'll be fine. So I told her, she can't sleep, she wants a doctor to give her pills. So I said, Parim Lama, I will sit with you. Can you spend one hour on just doing a breathing practice to calm down? Because she's had, I can't even tell you what she's gone through in her life to be where she is. She's from the untouchable commu community. She's a woman from the untouchable community. She's like the lowest of the low. Um, Velit, exactly, thank you. And so I, would she invest one hour in self-care mm. and not take the pill? No. She would rather outsource her healing, take, give the responsibility to someone else to heal her. Isn't this true of all of us? We'd rather go back home, binge on some, we are tired, binge on something, food or entertainment. We don't very often, we'd rather outsource our worries, take a pill, mm. right? So as artists, our fundamental job, displaced or not displaced, our fundamental job is say, can we take responsibility for ourselves and for our community? You know, can we hold each other? That is the essence of healing, mm. not the pill. I mean, the pills are important sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, so sorry about that. But I mean, medicine is important. I'm not negating the value of medicine. But so much of the time, healing lies within us. And we need to make that effort, that journey. Do we do that? Well, so just, so Ozempic, great example. Eh? Ozempic is Ozempic. like a weight loss drug. Everyone wants it. It's like, you could have, there are, there are plenty of better ways to do that. Uh, mm. But it takes effort, it takes time, uh, but it's like, no, everyone wants the pill. So it's, you know, it's a great example of how yeah. it's just more convenient to do it yeah. in a way that is outsourced, if you like. And sometimes you just have to put your phone off for one hour before you sleep, and we won't do it. We want that, just that small things we want mm -hmm. to do, we don't do, but that's where the arts come in because we can buddy each other. I can be your buddy. You know, we can work out together for that one hour or we can practice something together. That togetherness. Whatever happens, that we will not let go of each other. Mm. You know, and that's what we had even 20, 30 years ago it, before we had cell phones and social media. Our ways of connecting are becoming more distant. Mm. That is sad. And I think that's where we're coming up to time, so we're going to have to to wrap up there. But I think that's a really, a really kind of um, apt note to end us on, and maybe to put that a question to take away of how can we continue to connect? How can we connect with an arts practice? What what can we do together and for ourselves? So we're at time, so we're going to have to wrap up there. But thank you so much to our panel, and thank you for all your questions and engagement as well.